evening, Vladimir. Students learn better with their cameras off. Um, they find that when the camera's on, students tend to spend too much time like concentrating on what's going on on the screen and making sure that you know they're they look good on screen not so much good but you know like they're not doing anything wrong whereas if they turn their cameras off they can just relax and listen and actually do better so please just keep your cameras off um for those reasons and uh, i do the same with mine because you really don't need to see my ugly mug while i'm blathering on and on about statistics okay so before we begin with the uh, lesson, you know, the actual material, some of the things we're going to go over, um, the assignments and grading and SAS and expectations and all sorts of, of fun um, kind of bookkeeping stuff. But before I begin with any of that, um, does anybody have any questions they need answered before we begin? I should say want answered. Oh, and um, by all means, please feel free to come off of mute and ask questions. Stop me in the middle of a sentence. You know, think of this as a regular Socratic discussion that would happen in a normal classroom. It just so happens that it's being done remotely over the internet, right? So if you, you know, if you have a question or a comment or something, then just bring it up. And uh, I, I, I'm pretty good. I, I've been doing this long enough that I can, uh, somebody can interrupt me and I can, I can handle it. Okay, so um, assignments and grading and, and, and junk like that. The first thing I want to point out is that if you've looked into our class uh, room at all, you may have noticed some odd stuff going on. The first being that the assignments don't seem to fully match with everything. Um, and the big thing is, is that um, I've been teaching this course for ooh, going on three years now. Um, and in those three years, I've probably taught eh, 30 sections of it. So, you know, well over a couple hundred students. And it's been my experience that some of the things that the school has designed into this course work well. And some of the things that they have designed into this course do not work well at all. And so I have taken the liberty of changing some things. Um, one of those things that I've changed is I've gotten rid of any and all group work requirements. So it used to be that your homeworks had um, a group work component. In fact, if you look at the rubrics, right? So if we go to the rubric for um, the homework, you'll notice it says 110 points on the rubric, even though the assignment is only worth 100. Because if you read through here, there's this completion of the peer evaluation rubric, which was worth 10 points. Well, you're not gonna be forced to work in groups. This course is actually designed, the school thinks it's a good idea to force you all um, into groups, to work in groups. Now, I think working in groups is a fantastic idea. And I absolutely wholeheartedly support that idea of you working in groups. What I don't support is um, forcing you into groups because you all have very busy schedules. And for three of you to try and find a time where you can meet on a regular basis as a group is pretty darn impossible if I was to just randomly put you into groups. So I've gotten rid of um, any and all group work components of this course. So anytime if you look at a rubric and it says anything about, you know, a, a peer evaluation or, you know, work with your group or anything that talks about working with groups, just ignore it. That does not apply in my class, which means that oftentimes the assignments don't align perfectly with the rubrics. So for the most part, the rubrics still 
hold, but with tweaks, right? So, you know, don't look at the rubrics as if they were etched in stone. They're a little bit off. So you can see that I took 10 points off all the homeworks. So they're only worth 100 instead of 110. Also because it's just so silly to have something out of 110 points. It just makes it so hard to do percentages and all that junk. So the mini project is worth 150 points. I believe that was different. The critique is worth 100 points. Um, and then the final exam, the final project, not an exam, sorry, take that back, calm down, no exam, just a project, uh, 250 points. So that, that adds up to the full 1,000 points. So your grade is out of 1,000 points. Okay, so there's nothing else that, so if you see anything else listed anywhere, um, I've tried to go through and, and kind of get rid of anything that is listed, you know, like in the, if you go to the module, the unit one preparation, I've tried to go through here and find anything that talks about groups and gotten rid of it, but some stuff has slipped through the, the cracks. Most of these videos that I list here um, are my own that I've created that people in other classes don't have. So this, this will look different, you know, if you've taken this before or, or anything like that. Um, none of the videos are required that you watch them, just like it's not required that you read the book, right? Um, it's all on what you think you should or shouldn't do to help you prepare for the topics at hand, right? So if you feel like you already know um, all of these learning objectives fairly well, then go straight to the homework and don't bother watching any videos or reading anything in the book. But if you feel like you might need some help with some of those, well, then I've got videos to help you with all the topics. We've got SAS videos to help you how to do things in SAS. When available, we have things to show you how to do it in R or in Excel. Which brings me to the second point. The um, student expectations and SAS, right? The school used to require all students in this course to do all of their statistical analyses in SAS and only SAS. They did not allow students to use any other technology other than SAS, you know, except for like basic computations, you can do the calculator, that kind of thing. But any type of analyses needed to be done in SAS. Just within the last year or so, they have changed that policy and they now no longer force students to use any kind of technology. Basically, students can use any technologies they want. So you can still use SAS, you can use Excel, um, you can use StatCrunch, R, uh, Excel, SPSS, I think I said Excel twice, um, anything, anything you want. But here's the, the rub the school itself still only supports SAS. So they have these really cool um, online workshops that you can sign up for that um, basically teach you how to use SAS to do all the stuff that you need to do. But in those workshops, of course, they're only gonna show you how to do things in SAS. Um, they only require professors like myself to teach things in SAS. So if you ask me how to do something in Excel, I'm more than happy to show you because I know Excel. If you decide to buy StatCrunch, I'll show it to you in StatCrunch. Um, but if you want to know how to do something in R, I can't help you because I don't know R. Sheena. Um, when I click on the videos, it says this video is unavailable. Um, I'm not sure if that's something I have to contact help desk about. Yeah, you know, some other, are you talking about these SAS videos? Yes. Yeah, you know, some other students were saying the same thing. Um, and strangely enough, some of them work for, for me, like this one didn't work for me originally. And then I updated the link and it worked and, and these were all not working, but then I updated them and they did work. So I don't know, I, I, I brought it to my Dean's attention and he said they all work perfectly for him on his end. And so he said, yes, you should contact IT about it. Okay, thank you. I would say, oh, well, no, it wouldn't be a, a pop-up blocker because you wouldn't get that kind of notice. Yeah, it's gotta be, it's gotta be something to do with, with IT. Maybe you need something installed or I don't know. It's, there shouldn't be, um, there shouldn't be a permission thing because these are all just, you know, housed out on YouTube and 
everybody has access to them. So it's very weird why it's doing that for some, something. Uh, but anyhow, um, let me know. And I can always, um, I don't know, I can always maybe copy a link and, and stick it somewhere and see if, if you have better chance with that. Like for instance, if I do this, uh, try this. Hi, this is Sharon from sastatisticalprogramming.com. In previous... Uh... So let's... See if that link works, and then if it does, we know it's something in uh, the classroom. And if you are in H2, not H1, I don't know if I fixed it in H2 yet. Let me see. Oh, it works. Okay. So it sounds like it's something weird to do with Canvas. Yeah, because yeah, they all work for me, which is very strange. Hi, this is so it, it's something to do with the Canvas interface. Yeah, contact IT and just let them know that, and tell them what happened, that it wouldn't work if you would click on it in Canvas, but when I opened it you know, in an external tab and then copied the link Welcome to this quick and, um, and gave it to you, it worked. So that's very strange. Okay, so this has happened in other courses. All right, so that's good to know, Christina. I would, I would, I would highly recommend and and beg and plead with all of you to contact IT, contact your advisors, get this word out because I keep bringing it to my dean's attention, and their response is, "Well, when I click on it, it works." <laughs> I'm like, "Okay, fine," but that's not solving the problem. So I think if the squeaky wheel squeaks enough, maybe they'll figure out what's going on and they'll fix it. And it seems like it's something to do with the, uh, the permissions they're doing in Canvas, but anyhow. Uh, the bottom line is this. Um, most of these videos, you can find versions of them going directly to YouTube, right? So you know, if you have a problem with the link, I, I would literally just say, well, you know what, just go to YouTube and just put in basically the the uh, the title loading data from excel into sas studio right so uh, let's try uh, loading data excel to sas studio there you go loading data from excel and then just click on that on. and watch it I'm directly in sas uh, i mean uh, sorry directly in youtube so that that's what I would suggest if you're really having problems with the links. Um, and then, you know, obviously, if you need help with SAS, I can always help as well. Okay, so back to the technology, like I said, um, I will be defaulting to everything in SAS. So the, the my default will be to show you how to do things in SAS. And I won't show you how to do things in any other technology unless you specifically ask for it. But please feel free to ask for it. Okay. The only reason why I'm not going to show you how to do the things three ways, well, there's two reasons. One, I don't want to confuse everybody by showing you how to do something in SAS and then showing you how to do it in Excel and then showing you how to do it in StatCrunch. And you're like, oh, crap, it's all getting mulled in my head. I don't know which is which. And two, we only have an hour. So I don't want to spend a lot of time showing you how to do things in other technologies. If everybody's going, I'm not using that technology. Why is he wasting time showing me how to do it in that technology? Right. So I'm just going to show you how to do everything in SAS. And then if any of you are you know, working in Excel or some other technology, just ask and I'll be more than happy to show you how to do it in, 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 in whatever technology you're using. Like I said, if I know how to use it. I don't know how to do R at all. Um, I am an absolute expert in Excel, so I can show you everything in Excel. Um, if you decide to use SPSS, I kind of know that a little bit. Um, and then if you decide to spend the money on StatCrunch, I'm an expert on StatCrunch. Okay, questions on the technology and how that works. Okay, um, one other thing as far as your expectation, my expectations of you, right? Student expectations are concerned is, um, you know, there are due dates and you guys need to stay on, on, on schedule and get things done um, on time. Um, the other thing is, is, you know, please just follow the instructions on, you know, each of the assignment pages. It, it's pretty, Self-explanatory as far as what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it. I'm looking at these and these look like none of these work, I bet. Yep, look at that. What about if I try and do that? Nope, 
of course not. Yeah. So I don't know what's going on with these things. Hey, Dr. McBride, this is Anthony Madry. And uh, and one of my, in my last course that I took, I had these same issues, and I did a uh, a reset, and I emptied my cash. I emptied the I, I addressed those things that were in my history, yeah. and when I did that, I was able to open up everything I needed to open up. Okay. And I work on a Mac, and so there were uh, there was a funky like little series of things like Control Alt something else, and then it erased everything and then it opened right up. Okay, that's good to know. So yeah, maybe clearing cash and cookies might work for everybody. Right. Um, while I'm on homework, I wanna make sure that if you guys haven't already found the announcements, please go find the announcements and read through all of these. There's a lot of very important information in these, especially the Google Drive access announcement. You're definitely going to want to bookmark this. Right. When you click on this, it will open up a folder that I created in a Google Drive for just this course. And in here is all of the stuff that you guys will need. First and foremost, this thing right here has the recordings for all of our meet sessions. So after tonight, I will be adding a line here and putting another one for week one, session one. And these are just the dates of the, the classes. So you can just see you know, the newest one back to the oldest one. And then when we have our second meet session this week, it'll go over here and so on and so forth. So if you ever want to work ahead, right, you can always just watch these videos ahead of time and get going on that stuff. They're a great resource, a great source of information. I go through the homework questions time and time again um, in this course. So if you go back and watch any of these older uh, recordings, you'll see me answering homework questions on the same questions over and over and over again. So, you know, if, if I didn't explain it a way that you understood once, I'm sure on the second or third time it'll click. So that's a, that's a great resource. The weekly videos resource is basically what I did is all of the videos that I put into each of the module uh, preparations. And these are my videos, not the, not the class videos. I put them here as well. So for each week, this is just a collection of videos that I put together that help you learn the material for those weeks, okay? So that's, that's that resource. Then under SAS stuff, the most important resource is the how-to guide. This one's really super helpful because it tells you week by week how to do the things that we're doing. So in the first week, you're just supposed to create your account and upload some stuff. And then in week two, when you're doing frequencies, well, this is how you do it. You go to the SAS menu, you go to statistics, you go to one-way frequencies, you click on your data set, your variable, and you're good to go, right? So it kind of gives you the, the menus that you click through to get what you need to get. In, in the cases where you need to do some basic coding to get SAS to do what you need to do, because SAS has become a, a point and click thing. This, the SAS studio or SAS on demand, as it's called, is all menu-based, right? You, you click here and you open this menu and you you click here to, to tell it you want to use this, this data and you click here to, you know, to kind of, I want this test, this test, this test, and then you just run it and, and it runs. Well, SAS is really a, a programming language. And when you're clicking on all these menu things, it's actually what it's doing in the background is it's writing code in the background and then it's running that code. Well, sometimes it doesn't do exactly what you need to do and you need to actually augment the code a little bit. And I'll show you how to do this later. And when you augment the code, well, I've actually given you samples of the code that you would use to get it to do what you need to do. So for instance, when you need to find multiple modes, when you're trying to calculate the mode of a set of data, and this happens with most technology, if you do it in Excel, unless you use the mode.multi or the multi-mode function in Excel, if you use just the standard mode function, it's going to report just the first mode, the smallest mode that it finds. But if your data has more than one mode, i.e. it's multimodal, you're screwed because it's only gonna tell you the first one. And same with SAS. So you have to give it this extra code for it to actually give you all of the modes. And this will list all of the modes for a set of data. So it's little things like that. Um, when we get into graphing some stuff, 
The histograms that you can get out of the menus aren't great. If you use just a little simple code, you can get a much better looking uh, histogram and then an even better looking histogram that um, a student came up with. Some of this code was mine and some of it was from previous students. Um, so, you know, if you have fun and, and go crazy and, and find out some really cool stuff to do with code, I'm just gonna add it here um, as well, because, you know, we might as well all benefit from people um, you know, doing some research. So that's the how-to guide. You definitely will use that. The other stuff is, you know, it's helpful. Probably won't look at it that much. Um, but then the next most important thing is the homework questions. So this is, you know, a Word document. It's a Google Word document. You can download it and, and save it as a Word doc. But these are all of the homework questions. So you don't have to go to the book and basically retype them all up. They're already here. So what I would suggest for all of you is to literally just go here, download this sheet, and then just go, all right, and then type in your response and do that for each one, right? That's what I would suggest. Um, it, that's the easiest. So Dr. McBride, are you saying when I look at the Google Drive and I look at, so I see the data sets, I see, so on the files, the homework questions, are uh, are in that in that same drive, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is this is the this is the math eight hundred seven folder that is linked from the class. And if you go to the homework questions folder, you'll see that there's a set of homework questions for each of the five weeks. And then there's okay. also all of the data sets um, for each. If you click on here, it gives you the data sets by weeks, and then the ones for the project files. But if you read this first, like it says to do, it'll tell you that you can download this zip file, un unzip all of the data files into one place on your computer. And then when you go to SAS, you can upload all of them into SAS all at once rather than one at a time. Because if you, you know, if you go week by week, you have to kind of upload them one at a time or, you know, as a, as a block. So otherwise, if you do it, um, you know, with the, the read me first way, you just get them all uploaded all at once. You don't have to worry about, you know, uploading new stuff each week. All right, so um, those are two things that are gonna save you time, right? The, the homework questions definitely will save you time um, and the data sets in PowerPoints are just um, copies of the PowerPoints that I use each week. So, you know, this is a copy of the one that we're going to do this week and so on and so forth. So they're all there as well. So you don't have to be scribbling down notes. They're all there for you. So I tried to put together everything that you could possibly want or need that will make this course, you know, as easy on you as possible. Okay. Um, now, with that being said, one last thing for student um, expectations. Assignments. Uh, let's see, I'll go to announcements. How to get 100% on homework, right? To me, my philosophy has always been that homework should be a learning exercise and not an assessment exercise. Homework should not be something that you get wrong. Homework should be something that is practice. And if you get it wrong, you need to fix it and do it again until you get it right. So everybody should be getting 100% on the homework, but you know, I'm not just gonna give you 100%. You still gotta get the stuff right. But rather than having you just do the homework and then turn it in and me grading it and you get a grade and then handing it back, you know, and we've already moved on to new material. Um, I want you guys to work on this stuff ahead of time and then be able to ask questions during our second weekly Zoom session, right? So every week, <clears throat> the first session, whether it's Sunday night or Monday night, and right now, as I said in my email, Sunday night is winning out um, by a couple of votes. <clears throat> That first session each week is when I will do the um, go through the uh, PowerPoint slides and basically, quote unquote, teach you the topics of the week. And then with the leftover, because that normally takes about 30 minutes with the, the leftover 30 minutes, you are welcome to ask me questions. If you've already started on the homework, we can go through some homework examples. I can show you some things in, in SAS um, and then, you know, you're on your way. And then the second meeting that we have that will happen either on Wednesday or Thursday night, depending again on your votes, will be that entire hour is nothing but question and answers. I have, I have no new 
uh, material to, to lecture on. It's just you need to, between the first meeting and the second meeting, you need to go out and start doing the homework and, and work through as much of it as possible. Ideally, work through all of it. That doesn't mean you get all of it finished, but you've at least attempted all of it and you've made note of the ones that you don't understand. So on that second meeting, you can go, can you please help me with question 25, part B? My pleasure. And I'll bring up question 25, part B, and we'll go through it. And I will literally take you through step by step by step by step how to do it in SAS, how to do it in Excel, you know, and what kind of answer you're supposed to get. And nine times out of 10, I'll end up just giving you the right answer. Because I really don't care about you getting the answer. I care about you learning the process, right? So once you've done all of that and you've finished all of that, then hopefully I've answered all of your questions and you feel confident that you've got the, the homework done correctly. But if you're still not sure and you want one last check before it gets graded, then you have to go submit it in Canvas um, no later than 9 a.m. Eastern time Friday morning. So you would go to the assignments, you would go to homework number one, and, well, let me put student view, so you can see student view. And then you would hit start assignment, and you would upload your file. Now, these files must be, please, all of you that are on uh, Max, these have to be submitted as either a Word doc, or a PDF, and Word is, is far more um, preferred than a PDF. And the main reason is when you, when you choose the file and you upload the file, right, and then it, it puts it in for, for me to grade it. When I go into grade things, oh, my God, I got to get out of student view so you can see what I'm talking about. When I go into grade things, let's say I want to grade homework one, I go into speed grader, it's going to give me a preview of your work right here. And I have this limited little number of tools where I can, I can click on something, I can highlight something, I can cross something out, and I can put in little notes and tell you, you know, what's right and what's wrong. That speed grader only works with Word docs and PDFs. Everything else doesn't appear properly in the window and it just doesn't work. And for, with Word docs, it works the best. All of the tools, the highlighting tools and all that kind of stuff works the best. Sometimes with PDFs, things are hinky, especially um, if you highlight something and then you change it into a PDF. Oftentimes the highlight becomes solid and I can no longer see what's behind it. So instead of something being highlighted in yellow, it's just covered up by a big yellow block. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that doesn't help. So that's one of the main problems with PDF. So if you are going to use a PDF, just don't highlight stuff. Um, if you're trying to, quote unquote, highlight something, you know, bring it to my attention, put it in bold, put it in italics, put it in a different color, but don't use the highlighter tool. If you're going to leave it in a Word document, then by all means, you can use the highlighter tool or bold or italics or different colors or a combination of all of them because they all work fine in the display window. They just don't work well with the PDFs. Okay, so if you do that, if, if you submit it early, what I'm gonna do is every Friday morning, all right, so I'll go back to the announcement and the thingy, assignment. Nope, wrong place. There you go. So every morning I'm gonna go in um, after 9 a.m. Eastern time, and anything that's been submitted, I'm going to go in and I'm going to grade it. I'm going to go through and I'm going to mark things right and wrong. And I'm going to put in um, some guidance as to why it was wrong and how you could fix it. I'm not going to tell you the right answer. I'm just going to give you some guidance. And then I'm going to put a grade and you'll get a grade. 80, 90, 92, 97, 95, 70, whatever it is, you'll get a grade. And then if you're happy with that grade, good, you're done. Move on. If you, you wanted to treat this more as like a, a, a dry run preview and, and you want to, you know, redo the ones that you got wrong, then that's all you got to do is look at my notes, right? You, you go in and, and it'll show you my notes and you can see, you know, what was wrong and, and, and the things that I told you you needed to do to fix them. And then all you have to do is fix them, 
right? And then resubmit it with your corrections clearly marked. So what I would prefer is that you just, you know, basically you still have the copy of the document you submitted the first time, open it back up and all the things that were wrong, just go in there and don't change them. Put the new answer, you know, like in a new color or something next to it. So I can see that, okay, this is where they changed it, right? So I can see, all right, they, they, they got it wrong the first time, but they took my notes and they, they internalized it and they understood what I said. And this is their new response. And yes, their new response is correct. And then I can go through there really quickly and I can go, okay, they fixed this, they fixed this, they fixed that, they fixed that. Now you got a hundred and we're on to the next week. Okay, so that's how that's gonna work. Any questions on that? Let me just make sure. I think it allows more than one submission because if it doesn't, this whole idea is screwed. Yeah, unlimited attempts. Okay, so we're good. Um, if, and like I said, I've changed things. So, um, you know, some things will be different than, than you might read something in the course that talks about something differently. One of those things that you might hear um, that's different is turn it in. I don't know why, but originally they wanted you to, to submit your homework assignments to turn it in, which is just silly because if you're all downloading, you know, my set of questions and then you're putting your answers, you know, after each question, then your turn it in score is going to be horrible because all of this text is going to be exactly the same as everybody else, right? So you're going to get really bad similarity scores. So turn it in for your homework is, is stupid. So ignore that if you see that anywhere. The only place where you're supposed to use Turnitin is um, for the mini project, the critique, and the final project. And really, the only time that it really matters is the critique. Because again, the mini project, a lot of times students copy the, the questions. And so then there's so much similarity that your similarity score is totally horrible. And same thing with the final project. Um, however, how will we know if SAS exercise requires something beyond the existing function like characters? Oh, great question, Christina. Um, probably the easiest way to know whether or not it requires coding is to just look at the SAS how-to guide. If there's code there, it's there for a reason because um, a question from homework for that set required something above and beyond uh, the generic things. Um, the other thing will be as you're playing around with it, you'll start to see that SAS is just not giving you exactly what you need. Um, and then thirdly, of course, ask me in the, uh, in the, the session, the second week session, and I can, I can help you with that. I can tell you off the top of my head, there's uh, a couple usually every week that they don't necessarily need coding, but they could definitely um, benefit from coding. There's, there's a couple of questions where you make histograms and the uh, instructions specifically say, create a histogram with uh, six or seven bins. And if you just do a histogram, it'll default like four. And then there's a place where you can go in, in, not in the code, but just in the menus, and you can tell it, okay, set number of bins to six. And then it'll give you six bins, or you set it to seven, it'll give you seven bins. And that's totally fine. That's, that's all you would need to do for the homework. But it still looks kind of crappy. If you went in and did this simple coding thing, you can make it look a lot better. And it's not so much that you're making it look pretty, but when you make it look better, it becomes more informative. And so then you, you just learn a little bit more. So, so that's one instance I can remember. There's the mode that I was talking about. There's, there's a, a thing where you have to do the mode of a couple different uh, subsets of your data. And then you have to do the mode of your data all together. Like, so you're going to take your data and you're going to group it. Group one, group two, group three, and find the mode of each of those groups. One of the, group, one of the groups has one mode. One group has two modes. And one group has no mode. And then when you um, stick it all together and do you know, all the data all together, it has three modes. And if you don't do the coding in SAS, the, the group that has one mode, of course, is correct. The group that's no mode is correct because it'll just say no mode. But the group that has two modes, it'll only give you one. And then when you do all the data together, when you're supposed to have three modes, again, it will only give you one. So you'll get both of those wrong if you don't do the simple coding. So things like that, I'll point out as we get to them. But um, if you just keep an eye on the, the SAS how-to, you'll see uh, you know, wherever there's code, it's there for a reason. All right, any other questions?
Okay, so those are student expectations as far as um, you know what to expect out of me. Well, you can expect um, a world-class education from an amazing, amazing instructor. Other than that, there's not much. Uh, no, seriously, in all honesty, um, some of the expectations that are put on us by the school is that um, we need to have your work graded and turned back to you within five days. I usually do all of my grading on Monday and Tuesday, except of course for the, the previews, right? So if you turn something in by that, that deadline um, Friday morning, I will grade it that morning and you'll get it back sometime Friday. Saturday at the latest, if I have something going, you know, like if I have um, meetings or something all day Friday, then I might not get to it till Friday night or Saturday morning. But usually I get stuff done uh, early Friday so that you have the whole weekend to make the fixes and then turn it back in on Sunday. For everything else that's due on the normal Sunday and you turn it in by midnight Eastern time, right? Everything is pretty much due midnight Eastern time on Sunday. I then also do most of my grading on Monday. So Monday morning, I'll get up and I'll grade everything and you'll see everything graded usually by sometime Monday. Again, if something happens and I have a lot of crap going on on Monday, at the latest, you'll get it Tuesday morning. So that's an expectation. So if you don't see your stuff graded by Tuesday, you might want to send me a little uh, email and say, hey, um, my thing wasn't graded, and, and I'll let you know what's going on. Usually it's because I, I didn't see it or something. I, that very rarely ever happens, but that's the only thing I can think of. Because because if something happened and I just didn't grade anybody's stuff off, I would send an email out to the whole class and go, hey guys, sorry, this week's been really bad. I'm not gonna get to your, I'm not gonna be able to grade your stuff till Wednesday or something like that. I'm usually really good about keeping you guys informed, which means please, please, please always check your emails regularly because I, I email the crap out of my students to keep them informed. Um, the other thing is, as far as emails are concerned, um, uh, the school tells us we have to reply within like 48 hours or something like that. Um, I usually reply within hours, especially if you email during normal business hours, right? I'm on the West Coast. I, I'm in near Seattle. So I work from about six o'clock in the morning until about six o'clock at night every Monday through Friday. So if you're emailing me during those hours, you're going to get a response within an hour, maybe a couple hours if I'm teaching another course, right? Like if somebody emailed me right now, of course, I'm not going to uh, respond until I'm done teaching you guys. Um, if you email me at night or on the weekends, don't expect a reply until the next day. Sometimes you might luck out and I might just be looking at my phone or, you know, playing on my laptop and I'll go ahead and, and respond um, to an email. But as far as I'm concerned, when six o'clock comes around, that's family time and I try and put the work aside. And so I try not to do a lot of things. So if you're emailing me in the nighttime um, or over the weekend, I tend to try as much as I can to ignore those. <laughs> it's actually hard for me to ignore them because I'm just very pedantic about those things. But with those, you might not hear back from me until the following day or not even until Monday if it's on the weekend. All right, so that's kind of all of the bookkeeping stuff I can think about um, that we need to talk about. Any questions on any of that kind of stuff? Okay, so what do we need to do this week? This week, you guys are gonna have homework, right? And you're gonna have that each week and like I said, you can work with your group if you prefer. It's not mandated. Um, I'll leave it up to you guys to, you know, uh, go to the discussion board and say, hey, I'd love to work in a group. Here are my available times. Anybody who, who you know, matches, let me know and we'll get together and we'll work on these things. If you work in groups, please realize that the standard doctoral level rules apply. We expect all of you to do your own work. You're not going to copy work. You're not going to share answers. This is a, you know, working in a group is a Socratic thing where you talk about it and go, okay, I'm working on question one. And I'm just, I'm a little, you know, what do you guys think we're supposed to be doing here? Not what's the answer, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and then, so that's going to be due each week. In week three, you're going to have still homework, right? Because you have homework due every week weeks one through five, everything except for week six last week. Um, in week three, in addition to the homework, you also have the mini project due. So you definitely wanna get started on that probably by the end of week two, middle of week two, after you've kind of done most of the homework for week two, you wanna start working on the project along with the week three homework because they parallel each other really well. Um, in week four, I believe is when we do the, um, critique. 
critique is due, yes, week four. Your um, critique is due Thursday at midnight. You, you have to um, submit it to the discussion board so everybody can read it and then respond to it. And then your responses are due by Sunday. That's for the creek. So the critique's the only thing that's not due on a Sunday. Well, I take that back. The final project is also not due on a Sunday because for some strange reason, the course actually ends on a Saturday. So week six, which is uh, you know deep into December, the class actually ends on Saturday the 18th, which means your final project is supposed to be due midnight, Saturday the 18th. I am totally fine giving you guys that extra day and I will let you turn in your final project no later than midnight, Sunday the 19th, okay? So within the body of the class, it'll talk about things being due on Saturday and the last day of class being Saturday, but just know I am totally fine with giving you guys that one extra day to get your stuff uh, done for that uh, week six if you need it. Okay. So here's how the points work out. So you can see that's a thousand points total. Um, we've talked about using SAS. It's not really needed until week two. So if you're having problems getting your account set up in SAS and getting everything you know loaded into SAS and all that kind of stuff, don't panic. You don't need SAS at all this week. Um, if you prefer not to use SAS, whatever technology you're going to use, please, please, please let the technology do the heavy lifting. I, I, I don't expect you guys to be doing any of this stuff by hand. There are formulas out there. You can do just about everything by hand. And sometimes looking at the formula and maybe doing it once in a formula, it's helpful to understand how the stats work and, and what it really tells you. Um, uh, whether or not you want to learn it that deeply is up to you. I think if anything, maybe just looking at the formula would help with that, but really let, let your technology um, do everything. And like I said, there are training sessions available to help you learn SAS, and I'm always here to help as well. Okay, uh, make sure you ask those questions early and often. That's stuff I already talked about as far as uh, expectations. And so without further ado, unless there are some questions, we can actually start talking about the actual material this week. So any last minute questions on any of that stuff before I go through the real stuff. Okay, so this first week is very vocabulary heavy, and I apologize. I'm not a big fan of vocabulary, and I don't you know, like testing on vocabulary, but you need to know what these words mean so that when they talk about them in the homework and when I talk about them, you know what the hell I'm talking about. I think we all know what a population is, right? It's just a, a set of data. We know that a sample is just a subset from that population. A statistic is just any kind of number that's calculated from the sample, whereas a parameter is anything that's calculated from the entire population. So if you were, and remember, population doesn't have to be like everybody on the earth. It can be whatever you're just interested in knowing something about. If you're only interested in knowing something about um, all of your patients, let's say you're a psychiatrist or a psychologist or something, right? And you've got, you know, 150 patients and you're only interested in what's going on with your patients, then those 150 patients is your population. And if you end up, you know, sampling that entire population, i.e. you go in, let's say you want to know the average age of your patients, and you go in and you get all 150 ages, and you calculate the average age of all 150 patients, that would be a parameter, because you use the entire set of data, the entire population. But let's say that maybe instead of doing that, you said, you know what, I'm just going to pick 10 of my patients at random, and I'm going to calculate the average age of those 10 patients, then that would be a statistic. It's just that simple. Okay, an experimental unit is the basic object. It's the basic thing on which you are taking measurements. So in the previous example, each of your patients would be an experimental unit because you were calculating the age, right? You were quote unquote measuring the age of each of those patients. Factors are variables in your experiment that are set by you. They're controllable by you. So really when we talk about factors in response and treatments and controls, those are really only applicable to a real experiment where you have a control group and a treatment group and you're able to manipulate certain things. You know, like this group gets 30 milligrams of this medication. This group gets 50 milligrams of this medication. 
and the control group gets a placebo. Well, then the factor would be the medication because that's the thing that you can control, right? You gave a different um, amount, 30 milligrams, 50 milligrams, and none when you gave a placebo. So that was a factor. The response would be the, the variable that you collect then that you observe that you're hoping has some sort of influence from that medication. So again, we can say you're a psychologist and you're trying to, uh, to treat um, schizophrenia, right? And so you, you randomly assign your patients to the three groups of the 30 milligram, the 50 milligram, and the placebo of some new medication that they say has a, has a, a, a great chance of uh, reducing the number of like schizophrenic um, breaks that's, you know, that, that patients will have. Well, you give them those things. That's their factor of, of how much medication they give. And then the response bar variable would be you would like measure over a month how many episodes they had, right? How many schizophrenic episodes they had. And so that would be the, the response variable. And then you would try and see if that variable, the, you know, the number of uh, episodes they had, had any kind of correlation with how much medication they got to see if the medication had a bearing, right? So those are factors and response uh, type of thing. Treatments are conditions constructed from the factors in order to observe the impact on the response, right? So the factor is just the variable. So in that case of my previous example, the factor would just be the medication. The treatment would be the 30 milligrams, 50 milligrams, and placebo, right? So the factor is just the variable that you're going to control. So medication. The treatment are the levels of factors, right? So that medication is going to be given at three different levels, 30 milligrams, 50 milligrams, and placebo, zero milligrams. So those become the treatments. Okay. And then of course the control treatment we know is just the people that get, nothing's changed. They're the control people. And that way we can see if the other people change based on their treatments. So here's an example. You've got three different fertilizers to try. One of them is currently in use. You're going to choose 10 of your fields at random. You're going to divide each of your fields into three sections, and you're going to apply each of the three different fertilizers to each of those different fields. I'm sorry, each of those three different sections in the fields, right? So the population would be maybe all cornfields, not necessarily just your cornfields, but all cornfields. Maybe they're just all your cornfields that you have more than 10. Maybe it's all cornfields in your state. Maybe it's all cornfields in the United States. Maybe it's all cornfields in the world. It just depends on you know, what you're trying to generalize to. That's where your population is set. The sample, of course, is just your 10 fields. The experimental unit, right? So the unit, remember, is the thing on which you are taking measurements. You're going to take measurements from each of the three sections of each field. So each section becomes your experimental unit. Because I'm assuming that what you're going to do is you're going to apply these different fertilizers and then you're going to measure the yield from each section, right? So which section grew the most corn? So you're gonna measure how much corn was grown in each section on each field, i.e. in all 30 total sections. So that's why each experimental unit is a section of the field, each of those 30 sections, because you're gonna measure how much corn comes from each of those. The factors, right? so you remember factor is just in general, kind of like the variable name. Like if you're going to have a, a spreadsheet and you were going to list all your data, what would you title the column that had that data? You would just title it type of fertilizer. And then in that column, you would list which fertilizer they got. Okay, this section in this field got fertilizer A. This one got fertilizer B. This one got fertilizer C and so on and so forth, right? So type of fertilizer is the factor. And then the treatments would be A, B, and C, right? Which fertilizer they got. And then the response thing that you would measure is the growth of corn, height, density, yield, you know, whatever it is you want to measure. Questions on this example? I, I have a question on this one. Go for it, Christina. So in terms of like the replications, can you talk about that a little bit? Because if I look at this, I'm guessing that if there's three treatments, 10 fields, three sections each, yeah. you would, you would, you're, I mean, you have, technically like 30 sections altogether. 
right? So are you going to have 10 replications of each treatment? Yes, most likely. Okay. Um, the thing is, is you, you, you wouldn't have to, but um, that comes back to uh, experimental design, right? What's, what's, yeah. what's a good experimental design? Usually right. you would, yes, you would, you would have three in each because it wouldn't make sense. Why, why would you take one of your fields and, and not do that, right? Why would you put like right. all three in one field, right? So it makes sense that each field would have um, one each, one, uh, one of the, each of the um, fertilizers in each because you would want to control for confounding variables, things that can screw up your results. Is, so is for instance, a, go ahead, Christina. Is that an instance where you would use a block design? Yes. Yeah, 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 you could absolutely use a block design for this. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Usually block designs are um, where you have two different factors. So there's an example in one of our homeworks where a guy is um, doing pottery and he's trying out, um, I think it was like two different glazes and uh, like four different kiln temperatures or something like that. So that was a block design because it would be blocked by both glaze type and kiln temperature. That's usually how a block design is run. But you can you can block by one thing, but we don't normally call it that. It's the same idea. It's just not technically usually referred to as a block design. It's not necessarily wrong. It's just not really how you would refer to it usually. Um, but I like that you're thinking that way because in your mind, you should be thinking of it as a block design because it, it pretty much is a block design. It's just not what we would call it. <laughs> I know that no. sucks, but. Uh, no, no, that's okay. I'm just thinking about how you would, how you would, it, I mean, I was just thinking about how you could, would control for different soil types and everything in that example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's exactly what you would do. And, and, you know, and that's why you would, you would kind of spread the love and you would have three different fertilizers in every field because. Hopefully, if you had an insect infestation, it wouldn't be in just one part of the field and affect just one of the fertilizers. It would hopefully infect the entire field. So you would get an even, right, kind of confounding amongst all of them. And you wouldn't have to worry about the insects screwing with your data because they were evenly spread across all three sectors of that field. Same thing with the differences in types of soil. You know, field one and field two might have two completely different soil types, but within each field, it should be fairly homogenous. So by putting three different sectors in each field, rather than saying field one, two, and three are all going to be this um, fertilizer, and then four, five, and six are all going to be the second fertilizer, right? And then seven, eight, nine are all going to be the third fertilizer. Well, then you 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 haven't controlled for insects and types of soil because each field was just one experimental unit, right? By taking each field and breaking it into three parts, you're kind of getting rid of those compounding variables because now they all share it, right? They all share the same soil. They're all going to get the same amount of rain. They're all going to get the same amount of sun. They're all going to get the same amount of insects, right? You, you, as an ex, as a, as a, an experimenter, right? As somebody who's going to design an experiment, you always have to think before you, you know, design the experiment. You always have to ask yourself, what do I want to measure, and what could possibly influence that measurement? So, if we're trying to measure corn yield, we have to think of what are all the things that could affect my corn yield. Well, weather, right? So, how much water it gets, how much sunlight it gets, um, how good or bad the soil is. If there's any kind of pest problems, right? These are all the things that can affect it. Okay, so now I have to design a study that minimizes those impacts across my different trials, right? The three different fertilizers. And the best way to do that is to make sure that you're mixing those fertilizers up as much as possible so that if there is a difference in irrigation, rain, sun, soil, uh, pests that they will be evenly spread amongst all of them and therefore they no longer become a factor right because if if they all have both 
corn that was grown in the sun and corn that was grown in the shade, then whether or not it was in the sun doesn't matter because the total yield would be the same for all of them if the fertilizers didn't have an effect because they all had the same sun and shade, right? And if they all had an equal distribution of good soil and bad soil, then again, that wouldn't have effect on the yield because it's the same for all of them, right? So, so that's how you basically control for confounding variables is you make sure that all of your different treatments get equal treatment, right? That they all get equally confounded, so to speak. Make sense? Questions? Okay. So different types of sampling designs. You've got systematic, convenience, cluster, random, stratified. They all are very similar. Um, they all have their advantages and disadvantages. Basically, the gold standard, the best type of sample you could ever get is a simple random sample. That's what you always want to try and strive for. Sometimes it's just not possible. So sometimes you have to sample a different way. And then you just have to keep in mind that your sampling technique can have a large influence on the results you get. So just keep that in mind. Um, okay, so samples, you know, a good sample should be somewhat representative of the population. So for instance, if, 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 you, if your population is 30% um, Latina, then you should have a sample that's 30% Latina. Um, if your sample is, you know, 25% Republican, then your, or sorry, if your population is 25%, then your sample should be 25% Republican. Only if those characteristics will have a confounding effect on what you're measuring, right? If you're just measuring someone's um, height and weight, it does not matter what their voting preference is. So you wouldn't have to worry that your sample was representative of, you know, Democrats, Republicans, Independents. However, if you were measuring someone's um, yearly income, well then, yeah, you should definitely look at their uh, political affiliation because there is a strong correlation between how much money someone makes and whether they lean more conservative or liberal, right? So the being a representative sample really only applies to those characteristics that could possibly have an impact on your response variables, the things that you're gonna measure and see if they change from one group to the other. So if you were um, you know, measuring for, I mean, even height and weight, then you would definitely want to make sure that your sample was representative of the population across race and gender, because we all know that gender influences your height and weight, and so does race, right? So, though, but if you, again, if you were, you know, asking for, I don't know, if you were measuring something that didn't involve those, like IQ, then it wouldn't have to be representative, because genetically, your, 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 your gender and your race has zero influence on your IQ, right? Someone who's a female isn't automatically smarter than someone who's male, and someone who is, you know, Latina or Caucasian isn't automatically smarter or dumber than another race, right? So you wouldn't have to worry about those samples being representative if you were only concerned about IQ scores. So it's that kind of thing. Representation or being representative only matters on those characteristics that could possibly influence the thing that you're measuring. Some things to always keep in, in, um, in mind when you're trying to come up with this good sample. Like I've already stated, you always want to think about confounding variables and then try to control for them as much as possible. You definitely always want to look out for self-selection, what's called voluntary response bias. Basically, what this means is anytime you give people the option to be a part of the study or not, you have automatically ruined the validity of your data. Full stop. Um, Can you say that a different way, uh, Dr. McBride? Yeah. Basically, what I'm saying is if you ask somebody a survey question and you give them the opportunity to voluntarily um, answer the survey questions or not, 
that introduces what is called a voluntary response bias. And any, any and all data that is gathered through surveys and, and anything that is subjected to voluntary response bias is by definition inherently faulty. It is bad data, which means any and all results you get from that data is suspect at best. That is why time and time again, you will see these exit polls done during, you know, during election times, they will ask people, oh, how did you vote on this? Who did you vote for? And all those kinds of things. And then they will take those polling results and say, according to the exit polls, candidate A is projected to win. And then all of a sudden candidate B wins. And you're like, well, how the hell did that happen? Well, because of volunteer response bias. So anytime you are um, surveying people, those results are always suspect. And often they're complete and utter crap. So just keep that in mind. Anytime you see survey results, just know that you always have to take them with a grain of salt because they've done study after study after study after study. And they have proven beyond a shadow of a doubt the type of people who will respond to a survey are statistically significantly different across all measures than people who will not do a study. So it doesn't matter what you're asking, what your survey is about. If you go up to a bunch of random people and say, will you take this survey or not? The people who say no will be significantly different across all of your measures than the people who say yes, which means when you base your results on the data you get from just the people who say yes, they're going to be skewed because they're not going to have all the data from the people who said no. So survey data is always crappy data. But the problem is, it's the best we can do in a lot of situations. But the problem is, the average Joe Schmo on the street doesn't know this. So when they're presented with survey results, they just think, oh, well, these are good. These are representative. This was a survey. It was conducted by a reputable person. These results are great. No, they're not. And, and what makes it even worse is when they aren't conducted by a reputable um, person, then they become even worse, right? So survey results can go from slightly suspect to complete and utter crap, depending on who did the survey, how the survey was conducted, and what their sample looked like. So just keep that in mind. Okay, any questions on any of that? Okay, that's all I got for you. The last thing you guys want to do is, um, you know, make sure that you can um, get on SAS and get all your SAS stuff uh, running because we'll be needing that for next week. So for this week, make sure you get going on the homework. Um, feel free to create groups if you want to work on them. Make sure that you get your SAS all set up or whatever tech you're going to use. Um, Go look out for, you know, keep an eye out for those SAS workshops. And if any of you find any information on the SAS workshops, please post it to the discussion board so everybody else can, can find out about it. They do it through the, um, the learning commons or something like that. I can't remember what it's called. I teach for so many different schools. I can't keep them all uh, uh, straight. Uh, Vandana, how do you pronounce that? Is it Vandana, Vandana? Vandana. Vandana. Um, what were you going to say? So, yeah, I received an email from the learning commons about introduction to uh, SAS, but yes. the date listed is August 21st. So I registered, <laughs> so I registered for that course uh, at that session and have not received any confirmation. Okay, so um, what, yeah, what I would suggest is contacting the Learning Commons and go, hey, do you have one that's maybe, you know, more appropriate for me rather than one back in August? And they, they tend to run them pretty frequently. So um, I would highly recommend all of you um, try and find one, you know, for now there's, there's gotta be one that, that's, that's in November. I, I got the email, email said, uh, Saturday, November 13, when I went to register, it's oh. it, the only one shows up is on August 21st. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe they did not update the date. Ah, uh, I see what you're saying. So you went ahead and enrolled for the uh -huh. August one thinking that you'll just take it in November. That's a good thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would suggest all of you enroll in the August one and then contact <laughs> the Learning Commons and make sure that 
that means that you're actually enrolled in the November 13th one because it, it will be very helpful. Unfortunately, the problem is November 13th is literally the last week of class. It's week six. So it will not help you at all with this class, but you're all moving on to 810 and it will help you with 810. No, November 13 is coming Saturday. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking at December 13th. I'm so stupid. You're absolutely right. Yes, this Saturday. So it'll be perfect. So yes, everybody enroll in that and try and take it. It'll be very helpful. Thank you for that. All right, that's all I got for you as far as the PowerPoint is concerned. Any other questions? Okay, so let me show you one thing for those of you that have already, um, I know we're running over and by all means, if you have to go, go. Because like I said, this is always recorded. Um, I'm just gonna spend a couple more minutes and then we can get out of here. If you've already enrolled in SAS, right? Then when you go to SAS and you click on accept and you sign in. Oh, and when you enroll and you put in your, um, your email, it's supposed to send you an email with a link to like finish your registration. That email usually comes within a few hours. Check your spam folder over and over and over again because they often go to spam. So if you went in and you you know you filled out the thing and you clicked on the little thing and, and so it said okay you'll you'll receive an email and you haven't gotten it in a while, check your spam folder. It's probably in your spam folder. Once you finish it and you log in, then all you do is click on SAS Studio, and that's going to launch SAS Studio. Once you're in SAS Studio, and I detail all of this in my other videos, and I also detail it. Um, in uh, some of the documentation in SAS is it's very easy to upload your data. So all you have to do is under server files and folders, right? You'll have this, this thing, it'll look pretty much like that. And then you'll have this files home thing. And under here, you will have just one folder, your SAS user folder. What I always tell my students is if you just right click on it, so you right click on files and go to new folder, create a new folder and call that folder data files. And then you could upload all your data files to that rather than just uploading it to this folder. Now you can upload it all to this folder, that's fine. But I like to have two different folders, one for data files and one for programs. So when you go in here and you create a program, you can then save it over here in, under programs. And then you can bring it back up and use it for a later class and things like that. Because even when this class is over and done with, you will still have access to this SAS program. And anything you upload here stays here. It doesn't go away. Like you can see all my crap is here and it's been here for years, right? Um, if you need to upload files, it's very easy. You just click on whatever folder you want to upload stuff to. And then you click on this little symbol here, which is your upload symbol. And then all you have to do is click choose files and then find your files, you know, wherever they are. So you've downloaded them somewhere into a folder. And, and let's say, let's just say these were data files. They're obviously not data files, but if I wanted to upload all of them, you can just highlight all of them and hit open at once. And it'll list them all right here. And then you click upload and it will upload them all at once. So that was my whole point about in the, um, in here, when you go to data sets, and if you read this, it kind of explains that if you download the zip file and then unzip it to one folder, then when you go, you know, to that folder, when it says, you know, choose files, you, you find that folder on your desktop and then highlight everything and hit upload, it'll, whoop, it'll upload them all at once and save you some time and energy. So that was the last thing I wanted to show you guys. Um, so you can get going on that um, this week if you want to remember, you won't need it until next week. Okay, anything else? All right, that's all I got for you. So. Um, I will send an email out um, by, uh, let's say I'll send it out um, Wednesday at the same time. I'll give you guys until uh, Wednesday at noon for other people to fill out the doodle poll. And then I'll send out an, an email Wednesday with what time our second, um, our second meeting will be. It'll either be you know, Wednesday or Thursday night, depending on what time um, more people vote for. All right, thanks for showing up guys. And, um, Hopefully I see you guys all in a, in a couple of days when, uh, when we meet again. Thank you. Of course. Good night, everyone. Good night. Hey, good night. Thank you. Yep. Good night. Good night.